Welcome to Internet Misfits, a podcast that explores new, exciting futures and the people building them. We focus on creators and entrepreneurs who see the world differently. I'm Joe Cohen, your host and the founder and CEO of Universe, an app that lets anyone build an amazing website and online store with just their phone. In this podcast, I try to get at the essence of our guests' unique ways of seeing the world and understand really what makes them tick. My hope is that you leave with new learnings, tools, and inspiration to build out your own dreams. Let's dive in. All right. Today, we have Andrew Zuckerman on the podcast. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I am so, so excited to have you here. Andrew and his work have been huge inspirations for me over the years. I came across his work way before I met him, probably 15 years ago. And for those of you who don't know Andrew, he is an acclaimed artist, photographer, polymath at large. He's worked on just some incredible photo books, movies. He worked with incredible companies like Apple to capture their products. More recently, he produced a a podcast called Time Sensitive, which I highly recommend and was also an inspiration for this show. But, you know, I've gotten to know Andrew over the past couple of years and He's really a wide-ranging thinker in so many different areas and explores sort of intersection between man and machine and nature and science and technology. And I think it's going to make for a really interesting conversation. So maybe (laughs) we'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. It's funny. We're sitting next to this huge ball of books, which is like a, uh, you know, messing with my self-confidence a little bit. <laughs> Why? You have an incredible library. I'm Thank just like you. looking through this, thinking about all of the the time I've spent with a lot of the books on your bookshelf. Is there anyone that sticks out to you? Well, the one that caught my eye kind of immediately was um, Sapiens all the way yeah. back there. And I was thinking that was kind of at the front end of us starting to think about mm. our history and our relationship to the planet and kind of where we've come. And we all had it right before the pandemic, which right. must have been like a perfect time to ingest that book. Yeah. To me, what stuck out about that book was I think he introduced a one core idea, which was that humans are in the business of creating fictions, stories, and that those fictions, whether they're capitalism or democracy, shape the world. And humans have the unique ability to do that among all things in the known universe. And I just thought that was the thing that stuck. Even though it was like a a history of humanity, that idea was what really hit me. Well, you know, right now we're facing many crises, climate crisis, social crisis. But we're really in a narrative crisis because when you look at something like the climate, we have basically all the technology that we need right now. We just have to move from kind of belief and behavior over and he really made that point in that book and certainly made me think about it, especially when I was at the front end of of starting to slow down. It was sort of about that. How do we tell a new story? and How do we make a coherent expression of what we have and where we need to go and what we need to do to get there? Because it is a narrative issue right now. I mean, we just experienced the State of the Union last night. Watching it from where I sat, it seemed kind of extraordinary. And the story that was told was incredible. You open up the other side of the news this morning and it was you know, last night was filled with lies. So we are in sort of a an odd moment of a crisis of the human narrative. Yeah. In some ways, I get very hopeful when I think about that because I'm like, wow, the intrinsic problems here are tractable. Like, these are solvable problems. They're just sort of stories. Um, on the other hand, they seem vexing and puzzling, and I don't know how you change the narrative. I'm curious, like for you, what's your best guess? How you change the narrative? Yeah, like what or what is the narrative? Well, I think there are narratives for every situation, you know, obviously. But in terms of what I've been interested in, in terms of how we solve our biggest problems, which I believe are sort of most upstream in terms of energy and infrastructure, the narrative is changing. I mean, just look at the money that we've committed over the next 10 years to solving these issues. And I think that the bigger problem is that there are systems built around narratives and they can't move. There's like this lack of, you know, what some people call epistemic humility, you know, this idea of knowing or not knowing. And it's very scary when when you speak to people that believe they know. And most of the narratives that are anti-progress right now are based on the idea of 
knowing. Mm. And so that scares me a little bit. But, so but but the meta even... narrative is about knowing. Yeah, well, I love this. I mean, I, I would love to, you know, start a club of epistemic humbles. Hum- humbles. Yeah. <laughs> because to me, like, on the one hand, the idea of admitting that you don't know is so liberating and it opens up the whole universe of wonder because everything becomes possible. You don't have to know everything. But I'm curious, like, to me, when I think about climate and both sides of the climate mainstream narratives, I actually see a lack of humility on both sides. Absolutely. Um, you know, obviously, on the denying side, side that's a religious almost argument that that just seems ignorant at best but on the other side there's this doomsday narrative that feels all-knowing too that this is just our fate and this is what's going to happen it's going to be terrible you know so what's the epistemic humble but optimistic story here that there are specific technologies that we are just getting to understand that we should be putting into place but they need to happen like I said, super upstream in big industry. These problems are going to get solved by big oil and gas, big shipping. These are the the ways that things are going to change. In terms of like, there's a sort of optimism that some hold about the future. And there's, of course, a fear against that. I mean, I think that we're in many ways feeling the backlash of the optimism that happened 10, 15 years ago in the Valley about moving forward without any sort of fear of of messing anything up in many ways. We heard the the term unintended consequences a lot in the sort of post-social media backlash. But my interest has been much more in uh, really, really specific technologies that we need that are being held up. You know, certain things in the, the minerals and mining space, nuclear power. I mean, there are these narratives that, that we see that just get shut down by old belief systems that are not willing to actually look at at sort of future ideas. I mean, we could go down a long road of that kind of stuff, but I, I think that that in terms of, and, and specifically the work that I frankly have the privilege to do with some of the change makers in this space, where I can be helpful. I mean, we all suffer from a kind of, how can we affect things? What is our sphere of influence as individuals? You know, because in many ways, it's not just about kind of the things you do, whether you recycle, you know, whether you stop using plastic bags, these are important, of course. But when I think about my own sphere of influence and how I can help, it's generally in clarifying narrative and helping people feel things and not just think things. I mean, we are by a factor of six or something more affected by an image than a word, Hmm. you know, in terms of the speed. Feeling moves faster than logic. I think about that a lot. And so, in terms of how narratives have been used against progress and for progress, it generally exists in the realm of feeling. So, you know, when we look at data about the climate all day long, it doesn't really move us in the same way. But when we're told a story with an emotional arc that's true, we generally can take something on. And so I've been most interested in helping clarify and create stable stories that are coherent about what we're actually doing and try to use persuasion and marketing as little as possible. I think that that's something I learned from working with kind of some of the greats over the last 20 years is is marketing is a bad word. I mean, marketing is something you should never do. What you should do is tell your story clearly and respect the people that are hearing it, that they understand things. And then there should be an emotional connective space. You know, I think that that's where beauty, that's where aesthetics come into play. Hmm. So let's take one of those things. You talked about nuclear energy. And from my perspective on this, and I'm a real layperson on it, but nuclear technology feels like the great promise. It feels like it's the answer because it promises unlimited energy without emissions, without emissions that on the scale that matter at all. And it's the way that the sun creates energy. But nuclear research has been frozen and dollars have been frozen. That's starting to thaw. We're starting to see some life come back into fusion. There was a big announcement from the NIH last year. But how do you think we tell that story specifically better? That would be one that I'd need to learn a lot more about, to be honest. I mean, everyone realizes that three major accidents stopped nuclear advancement. And maybe for good reason at the onset, 
But what we don't understand is trade-offs and choice under scarcity. So it's essentially when you're stopping progress or research in nuclear energy, you're anti-nuclear energy, but at the same time, you also have to understand that you're mm. pro-coal and fossil fuels. Right. So one of the, I think, tough things for people to understand is that if you are against something, you're simultaneously for something else. Mm. And I think nuclear, I don't know enough about it. I haven't had the, the opportunity to really go deep on it. I have had the opportunity to go deep in other areas of energy, but nuclear specific, I would need to understand much more. But from kind of a layperson perspective, what I do understand is that the lack of progress in that space has promoted the progress in areas that we know are wrong. Hmm. So where I think solutions probably will be moving forward, at least from a kind of cognitive perspective, is to understand that trade-offs are inherent in everything and that we need to make choices even when choices are scarce and solutions are scarce, and that being against something inherently means you're pro something else. I love that. And I think it's so spot on and so missing from the dialogue. And I think it's in part a function of social media. Absolutely. Because we lose nuance and you don't need to have a coherent argument necessarily for a message to penetrate. And I actually think COVID was case in point. I mean, there were mistakes in so many ways on COVID, but what I found was that there were huge monumental policy decisions that were being made in the absence of playing and thinking about the counterfactual and the other side of the coin and what the implications are of some big gesture, right? In a vacuum, no one would argue with allocating resources or making huge sweeping changes to the economy and the health system to prevent you know, a pandemic, but at what cost, right? Like, and we're dealing with the implications of that now in many ways, and it's downstream, and it can take decades to follow. I am curious, like, how do we convey this idea that being against something or pro something has an inverse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly try a fair amount in the work that I do, but I just wanted to actually rewind a little bit. I don't don't know if I'm answering your question directly, but this idea about wisdom you mentioned a couple of minutes earlier, you know, which I've thought a lot about. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that word, what that word means. And I've done a ton of research on it. I published a book called Wisdom and stuff, but have learned actually an enormous amount since that was in 2008. But you look at the history of wisdom and it's really hard to get a a definition of it. And over time, it has changed a lot. Mythologically, Socrates was the wisest of them all. And he didn't believe he was. And the oracle says to him, well, it's because you believe you know nothing, which is why you're the wisest of all, which is the one that I've sort of stuck to the most. But over time, we have tried to understand what wisdom is, define it. It's gone in and out of style. It's unquantifiable. In an engineering age, it doesn't seem to be very much in style. It wasn't in style during the Enlightenment either. It sort of didn't come back until the kind of self-realization movement in the 70s. It's actually only been studied once academically, like truly, truly studied. She was kind of a woman who studied it, was sort of ostracized, and she went off and spent the rest of her career studying honeybees like Rudolf Steiner did. But there's this idea about wisdom in our current moment where it's about not knowing and it's about having an open kind of liminal space of not knowing, which takes a lot of bravery. And there's this this sense that that we live in these bubbles and we understand these these sort of chambers of thought And guys like Adam Curtis, who, if anyone hasn't watched Hypernormalization, which came out quite a few years ago, they should. It's on YouTube. Adam Curtis, brilliant filmmaker, who made this film about called Hypernormalization, which is sort of about how we normalize ideas and how we create, basically how we got to Trump was what he had made. And this idea that we don't seek what we don't know, but we in fact look for evidence to our presuppositions. And it happens when we move through basically all the media we choose to be served to. So we're served what we already know is true, and we further believe that one after another. So there's this lack of kind of this idea of not knowing, which drives all of my work, this idea of not knowing. And that is at the root of curiosity and at the root of the pursuit of things that you're interested in is not knowing. So whether it's visual or linguistically, whatever it is, music, 
I'm generally driven by what I don't know and what I'm curious about, what I think is worth understanding. But understanding is a whole other area and that doesn't happen quickly. So this idea of like, how do we shift the narrative? Like, it doesn't happen quickly. And you can't, it's not something you can be sold or, or believe in. Observation takes time. Looking takes time. Truly understanding something, at least for me, takes a huge amount of time. Hmm. I mean, when I get involved in an area that I know nothing about, whether it's being helpful with a big industry corporation or, or a startup in, in, in frontier technology or in my own personal work in my studio, it takes a long time for me to understand things. It takes a long time for me to understand something that I made. A lot of my work and a lot of my time is spent looking at things and not thinking when I'm looking and just trying to actually have a sort of panoptical experience of something, multisensory, and and time is what gives you that. Wow. That may have made no sense. No, no, it does. Like, can, you, can you tell me about an experience or an example of that with one of your works? Just sort of paint the picture. Of something that took a long time to understand? Yeah, and like, here's a great example. Here's, like? a, here's a great example. Because I just showed this a few months ago. So uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, it's like beginning of March, I've been working, I guess that's a separate story, but I was, I've been working on a project about someone's life story. And I, I interviewed him for about 20 years. And my last interview was February 28th, 2020. And I went down to Florida, interviewed this guy who I'd been interviewing for 20 years. Fascinating story. I'm doing a kind of narrative project about it now, which I kind of needed to, to wait until he passed away to do. So I finished that. I get back to New York. I have three kids. We were like, what's going on with school? This was a very early COVID thing. I got COVID, didn't know it at the time. And I didn't learn that I'd had it for a couple of months, but I was just kind of sick. And, and everything seemed kind of crazy in New York. And we decided to just pick up and go. And we went to this place we've had upstate for a long time. And, and uh, the whole family went up there. And I was just kind of, this place had always been kind of a vacation spot, you know, on the weekends or some time in the summer. But I'd never spent any time there. And I was so excited to be there during the shift in season, which I'd never experienced. And for some reason, I was always so busy from like March to July. So I kind of missed that space. And for no reason, I put up a camera and created a time lapse on a tree line off one of the decks in the house, just so, sort of looking out over the trees. And I don't know why, but every day I changed the card and I ran this time lapse for, you know, three, four months. And thought, this is cool. This is a forest going from bare to fully leafed out. I had no idea why I was doing it. And, and I didn't really think about that. I just thought, this is cool. Do it. And then I put it away and I put it in a drive and uh, didn't think about it. And never kind of found a use for it. And a friend of mine who runs this great conference uh, said, oh, we'd love for you to make some art for the conference. Do you have anything you want to show? And I was like, I haven't made stuff recently. I've been doing a lot of other things. I don't really have anything fresh that I want to show. I don't really know, but let me think about it. And I was cruising through like some work that was unrealized, kind of like the bottom of the barrel, to be honest. <laughs> and, I, and I looked and, and I saw this time lapse and I ran it back and I watched this forest go from bare to full in this incredibly frenetic way. And, you know, like a time lapse is just sort of, and it felt exactly like the moment of COVID. It felt like that directionless panic, that feeling of unknown, back to this theme of, of sort of what we know and what we don't know. And, and, and it felt like that moment to me. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I don't really want to feel that way anymore. <laughs> and I don't really want to share that with people. What was this whole thing about? And I thought, oh, this, this was about breath. This was an assault on our respiratory system. And trees, what are they, 30% of the, the oxygen that humans actually get. We're learning a ton about forests. And so in those three years between when I'd made that footage and when I was about to actually do something with it, you know, there was all this incredible AIs that came out that could interpolate the frames. And I ran it through one of them. And it made the forest not frenetic anymore, but actual breathing because it sort of morphed between frames and it filled in the space. And now when I looked at the work, it actually was showing me what that experience and what that time was about, that it was about an assault on our respiratory system, that while we were inside, nature kept going, 
that there was a sort of bigger than us moment mm. that was occurring. This was a human problem. Trees were just fine. And mm. they did their cycle. And they were actually there to sort of testify to what we were experiencing through this work of art. And I showed it at, you know, over three days at this conference. So no one knew what they were looking at. And I was fortunate to have the last speaker spot. And so I, I just said, you may have noticed this, this, this forest leafing out over the last few days. And this was what it actually was, when it was made, and how it came to look like this, and what I showed the audience what it would have looked like without the frame interpolation technique. And what it made me realize, and what it, it not only made me learn about what I was experiencing at the time, or a piece of work that I had nothing to do, frankly, with the concept of until the end of it, but what it showed me on a larger level and made me look at my larger body of work a little differently was that I've always been drawn to harnessing a technological tool, generally optical tools, that can be applied to some form of the natural world to help me understand it better and to create a bridge, to create an open channel where I can see it with clarity and kind of through beauty, slow down to really experience it and, and feel something that I could never describe. You know, we're in an audio medium right now and I'm trying to describe it and it may not, you know, I have no idea if this lands or, or is understandable at all to anyone listening, but that's why we need visual mediums. We need the experience of actually the phenomena of being around something like this to experience it. And so that's a great example of my own work that I don't feel ownership of actually. I feel fortunate to have been there when it was being made. <laughs> basically, but that that's why I make work mm. like that. So in that experience, it sounds like you were sort of guided by something, right? Like you didn't even know why you were capturing the forest. You didn't know what it would amount to. You had this footage. What is that? What's driving that? Yeah, I've, I've thought about that because it, it's happened many times in my career mm. where I unconsciously did something that later became important to me. And I need to believe that we're a multitude of selves. We're not a single self. And ourselves, are, I believe, are kind of born in experience, whether it's trauma or extreme success moments or moments of love, moments of sadness. All of these moments kind of birth selves that tend to speak up later in moments. And I've heard from some very smart people say, the trick is to be able to stand between the multitude of selves and not be controlled by any one of them. So there's like that idea. And I think that those selves are born through observational experience and they come back later. And whether you're consciously listening to them or unconsciously absorbing them, they're there. And I'm always interested in what is not in the conscious mind, but is still part of my experience. So I don't think that there was some self internally that, that knew that it would make this piece, but there was a part of me that said, you know, you should do that. And as I've gotten older, I've gotten better about listening to that voice that says, you know, maybe you should go do that. And not listening to the voice that says, no, you shouldn't do that because of this, this, and this. Because I just, I think that creativity is born through endorphins and you need to just do things and then they reveal their value later. It just doesn't work the other way. You can't strategically or quantifiably walk your way into inspiration. You need yeah. to do things. Yeah, I mean, and, and the way I'm hearing that, and this really resonates, is within each of us, we have these many selves, and one, one of those selves is this childlike, wondrous, epistemological, humble. Hopefully many of yeah, them. Yeah, right. But then there's also this other side, which is more of like an editor, which we normally think of as like the executive function or the prefrontal the cortex, the critic. And that represents this sort of all-knowing side, which is obviously ignorant in so many ways. But I think that's a really interesting dialectic in our own minds. So do I. And again, I've had this like sort of insane experience and filled with opportunities professionally of being around some incredible people, just some of the great minds. And what I've noticed connects the best ones are the ones that go, I don't know. Yeah. You know, the best architects 
can look at a rendering, can look at their drawings, can look at everything and say, but I don't know. We have to build the scale model. And then we have to walk through it and feel it. And you're a liar if you say you know what that's going to feel like. And I think that my biggest conflicts maybe in when I'm functioning collaboratively, especially in the, say, corporate world that I swim in sometimes, is when a heavily kind of critical voice in a room will shut an idea down before it has the ability to flourish. Ideas do not live on their own. They are on life support until they're really, really going. And so a big tell for me when I'm collaborating with people is their ability to not just listen, but to be excited by building on an idea that may or may not have value. But the willingness to pursue creative inquiry is just so important. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that seem to do the best long term, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting, right? Because I think this idea of wisdom and its relationship with knowledge, right? We often think about, or people often think about these things as similar. Entirely uh, different. They're entirely different. In fact, the way you're framing it is that wisdom is the admission of lack of knowledge, right? And, um, you know, I think- Or the way the Greeks, we should say. <laughs> so the first work that I came across of yours, and I didn't know who you were or, or what you had done, was the wisdom film. Oh, I think wow. that you produced yeah. in 08. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that really hit me. I remember I was I was in um high school and, and I was sick in bed and I somehow pulled it up and there was a part of it that really resonated to this day. You had Chuck Close, the artist, and he you know the so for for those of you who haven't seen it, what Andrew did was he gathered some of the greatest minds across many fields who are older, over 65. Over 65. And shot them on a stark white background, the full detail of their faces exposed. And they were just talking about their process and what they've learned and really exploring this idea of wisdom. And Close was talking about the value of questions. And he said that he's much more interested in questions than in answers. Well, he said, he said, I'm much more interested in problem creation. Right, right. You know, he turned out to be somewhat of a problematic character. <laughs> Uh, and and many in the project were sorry I I don't want to cut you off but yeah. I mean, I mean the thing about wisdom was look I was really young okay I was uh, thirty when I did it I just had my first kid and I had been asked to f do a portrait of Desmond Tutu Archbishop Desmond Tutu who embarrassingly I didn't know that much about I knew about you know what he had done with the ANC and in South Africa and, and some of the history around that and truth and reconciliation. But I didn't really know who he was as a person. And so I went to Kalamazoo, Michigan to make this guy's portrait. And while we were there, we got into a long conversation. And, and out of that conversation with some other partners, we realized that what was really missing was the great generation was going to leave us. And what they contained was an immense amount of wisdom, but we were at a moment in culture where we were deeply youth obsessed. I mean, all my friends, my contemporaries, other artists were, were definitely not making work like this. This was not cool. They were making work about youth culture, essentially. And I went completely the other direction. And, and Tutu very generously wrote letters to a list of 150 people that we'd come up with. This is 150 people that were going to be the most extraordinary people alive. And because the book that I'd had just previously, my first book called Creature, had done surprisingly well. No one thought it would do anything. That It was supposed to be a total failure. And it wound up being like phenomenally successful in the first year with a ton of support that I would have never imagined. It just hit a kind of mainstream thing. And so it was very easy to get at that moment to get big support for the next book. So I had this huge support going into it. I was able to take a full year off of my life and I circled the globe chasing the most incredible people to get kind of an hour or two with them. And I don't mean, you know, from one field, it was across the board. Nelson Mandela to Sir Richard Rogers or, or Judy Dench, John Hume, people that had had major effects on the world. And I got to sit there and, and honestly ask them about what they thought about the themes that we all think about. 
love, life, ideas, conflict resolution, things that that we all deal with. But they had had kind of the most specific experiences in those spaces. So it really wasn't about what they'd done in their life. It wasn't biographical. It was about their ideas, their wisdom I was trying to capture. Yeah. And, uh, and I'd never interviewed anyone in my life. My first interview was Malcolm. My first interview was Michael Parkinson, who was like the, like the greatest interviewer in Britain. He was like, letter, like Howard Stern, Letterman, all of ours combined, that was Parky. He had this famous show for many, many years. And I said to him, I said, I've never interviewed anyone in my life. This is my first interview I've ever done. And you're like the greatest interview ever. So maybe you could like teach me how this is done. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And he said, he said, he said, well, let's have a conversation and I'll tell you what I know. Yeah. And it was actually that to that point of sort of approaching it with kind of humility that really gave me all the room in the world. I had nothing to prove. I could mm -hmm. just be honest. And anyhow, so that project was great. And it was one of the first projects where I realized that if you're interested in exploring an idea and you want to share that with others, you need multiple doorways in. So it wasn't just a book. It was also a film. It was also an exhibition. Some people never saw the book, never saw the film, never saw the exhibition, but saw one of the mini books that came out. Or So it was about me also understanding that you have to create panoptical points of entry and that everyone is going to arrive at things differently. But what's important is that the sort of data you collect or the content you've, you've collected and to build systems around how you can push that out for different audiences. And this is an 08. This is pre a lot of stuff that now, if I'd had the platforms I have now, I would have thought about it, you know, obviously very differently. I don't know. Maybe it would have been a TikTok account. I don't know. But it would have, at the time, that, that's what I had at my disposal. And it was fundamentally a really powerful project for me that taught me a huge amount and got me curious about areas that I had always felt weren't for me. You know, I didn't grow up thinking that I, uh, that I had access to, uh, to understanding, you know, an economist or a politician. I just, I was kind of in my lane and this opened me up to the understanding that whatever you're curious about, you can learn the foundational, you won't become an expert in it, but you can learn foundational knowledge in that space. How did you, yeah. So, I mean, peeling the onion back there, like, how did you get into this stuff and, and, and what was your path to getting to that moment? getting into taking pictures? Yeah. Well, um, so, like, you know, where'd you grow up? And like, oh, like, like childhood stuff. Yeah, so I grew up in an area of suburban Maryland, say 20 minutes from the White House, like right outside of D.C. Both my parents are academics. My mother was a school teacher, ran a high school newspaper, and was a, which was actually probably the most profound thing about my household because it was largely run in my house. And my dad uh, is a pediatrician and uh, taught in medical school and ran a lab for his whole career at Georgetown and sort of academic physician and was very involved in technology. So he was from the beginning super involved in medical encryption. And he sort of had this belief and lobbied his whole career for online medical health records. And this idea that if we're, if we're given a social security number at birth, we should become a health number and our health record should be ours and we should figure out how to, he had a sort of utopic vision, which is actually now post mm. his career coming to life. I have friends that are building companies in that space. You see it happening now. We're cleaning up medical health records and creating standards for that. So he was very involved in the internet, early in the internet because of encryption and this kind of space. So I grew up with real to real computers in the basement and the phone on the modem, the modem with the actual phone that would go in. But they were both very interested in the arts and we always had a dark room in the house and they were passionate about making things. Like the house I grew up in, I'm the youngest of four, but there was also always lots of other kids living there for different reasons. It was a very kind of welcoming, warm environment where creativity was definitely the top. Hmm. You know, we made stop motion animation films, Super 8, and screened them for each other. And we made photographs. And my, my mother did Hebrew calligraphy and would make extra money filling out wedding invitation addresses, but would also make, you know, so she was always doing something, you know, so in our house, like if you were watching TV, which there was only one of, and it was quite small, you kind of got a dirty look. It was like, 
do something mm. was the kind of vibe in, in our house. And so from a very young age, I was given like a real camera. Maybe I was in third or fourth grade when I got my dad's Nikon and I was printing pictures with him when I was 10 or 11, 12 years old. And by the time I was maybe 14, I was like, this is what I do. This is who I am. It sort of created an identity. Growing up near DC and in that time, the hardcore scene, Fugazi and these bands from Discord Records and the punk movement there, the hardcore movement there was really welcoming. You know, it was all age shows. And so I would be like the photographer shooting bands and making things with friends and zines and all sorts of stuff. And then I was super fortunate at 14, my oldest sister, who's eight and a half years older than me, left college, moved to New York. And I had this photo teacher named Sandy Cavalier, who definitely changed my life. I met her when I was like 13 or something. And she just kind of took me under her wing. And she was just like, you enjoy this. She didn't say like, you're talented or any of that shit. It was just like, you enjoy this. And however much you want to do of it, I'm here for you. So I would go to her house on the weekends and print in her dark room and help her with projects. And to this day, we're still very close. But there was a journalism trip to Columbia University. And I was, I think I was a the high school photojournalist person kind of thing on, on the high school paper. And we went to New York and she took me and she took me to the International Center of Photography when it was on 94th and 5th in the old Autobahn mansion. And, you know, like Cornell Capo was there and stuff. And, and I was just like blown away. I couldn't believe there was a place that was just about photography and about the best and about being around the best. And I asked for an internship and I was 14 and, and my sister who'd moved to New York, let me live with her. I don't know what recent college grad <laughs> would let their 14 year old's uh, little brother live with them for a summer. And I got an internship there. And then I would be with bands at night. I was playing in bands, but I was also shooting and mostly shooting. And, uh, and I spent all three summers of high school in New York at the ICP, just like mm -hmm. cleaning dark rooms, prepping for the next teacher. But I got to be around some of the greats and I got to do my work. So it was always about finding a way to be able to continue doing it. And then I came up for art school full time after high school here and actually didn't love the experience of art school and really just started assisting and started making work. And by the time I was out of there, I opened my first studio and I also, I just don't want to skip over the fact that I also assisted some amazing people who were incredibly kind to me. One in particular, a great artist, Christopher Astley, who at the time was a photographer. He, he mostly paints now, but who really taught me a lot about aesthetics and how to see and how to look and how to run a studio and how to think about what you want every day when you go into work, which was something we would meet in the morning of coffee and be like, well, today we're going to do this. And sometimes it could be looking at something all day. And sometimes it could be making things. And he sort of very much taught me and continues to this day teach me, we see each other all the time, that looking is an act. It's not passive. Active looking is important. Taught me the value of spending time looking at work, your own, others. So then I, I just started working. I struggled. I would do anything I could, man. Like, you know, at the beginning, I think at one point I had like seven credit cards that I was doing those 0% transfers every six months. I had like a whole system for it, like the, the days of MBNA cards or whatever. And that's how I was financing my studio. And I was sharing my studio uh, at the time with, with another good friend. Who I still see all the time, John Jank in the painter. And I was also like working at Balthazar and I always had like another thing. I could always make coffee or work in a restaurant. But, but essentially, I was doing anything I could to keep this going and waiting and waiting and waiting. And at a certain point, I got some breaks and, and then very quickly got into a sort of hybrid role where photography was like the gateway. But then I wound up becoming a creative director and wound up directing commercials, doing lots of things that I, so I could handle sort of a client from a conceptual level and then execute on all the levels. So 
that led to building production companies and other things I did over time. But I was always sort of fascinated by working on my own work and then helping others with theirs. Mm. And there was always learning that carried over. And uh, there was sort of like a, they fed each other. Imagine listening to a podcast and not hearing an ad for a website builder. You'd be like, what kind of podcast is this? We know you need your fix, and we're not going to deprive you of that. At Universe, we believe websites are the main event, so of course we'd sandwich one in between our show. Here's the deal. Websites are dope, everyone needs one, and they can actually be fun to build and have some personality behind them. This is the part of the ad where I rattle off a list of all the things our website building product can do for you in hopes that you choose Universe over the competition. Create sites, build stores, analytics, email shipping off from your phone feels like playing with Legos, all that good stuff. We got it. I mean, you can make sites so good you'll shit yourself, but that's just brass tacks. At Universe, a website is so much more than just something you hear about on a podcast commercial. It's an extension of self. It's a way to interact creatively with the digital world. And we're hell-bent on helping the internet live up to its full potential. A more eclectic, more electric place. Because the internet shouldn't just be a space for squares. Grab a domain like .xyz and show those .com boomers what the internet's all about. Head to Universe. That's universe.se, but the dot is silent. Punch those puppies into the app store, my friend, and we'll see you out there. You have a kind of trademark aesthetic, uh, which is, for those who haven't seen it, you shoot things on stark white backgrounds. Not always, um, but often, yeah. Often, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And, but there is like a, if I, if I ask the average person who's familiar with your work, they'd probably describe it as like stark white background. It's either a creature or a human or a generally living things, object. Yeah. yeah. How, did, how did that come? Like, how did you figure that out, that approach? I mean, I, so, God, I hope they don't listen to this, but I did, you know, of all the beauty in my parents' house, they also cannot throw anything away. I mean, lovers of newspapers and books and things, and there was stuff everywhere. And I'm uh, like a hardcore minimalist. And I, I think very much responded to that sort of environment I was brought up in of a lot of stuff <laughs> everywhere that I was always obsessed with clarifying things, vacuuming it all out. Like cleaning is a, is a spiritual act for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm a brilliant cleaner. <laughs> like I'm a, I, I can clean like nobody. And I can't cook anything, but like I do cleaning. So I get immense joy from clarifying situations and getting rid of everything that's unnecessary. It gives me a kind of peace. It's weird. But my aesthetic was definitely born out of that sort of emotional response to clutter. And I didn't understand the aesthetic for a long time. It, at the first picture, I mean, I made pictures in vacuous environments all through school and, and, and forever. But it really was a, a trip I had taken with my now wife to a friend's place. Actually, Chris gave me his house for the weekend. And he had this place on North Fork. They still have it on the North Fork in Orient. And it had snowed. And at that time, I always hauled a big four by five view camera over with me. And, and Nikki and I went out for a walk and there was a dead bird on the snow. It had sort of, it was just bones, basically. It was very, very beautiful. And I made this photograph of it. And I couldn't stop looking at this picture of this dead bird on white. I couldn't figure out what I liked about it. I don't like dead birds. I didn't really love that about it. But I loved the form of it and what it felt like. And I just started doing that. And I didn't see a reason to not do it. And what I came to understand over time of making literally thousands of images exactly the same way was that once I'd found a language, I had a platform to say something. And there's a democratizing quality to a kind of unifying formal element, mine being that vacuous background. And what it does is it takes out all the other stuff. And some people say that context is the all important element of the truth. I would argue that in visual terms, that the truth actually can emerge when you release the subject from its context, when it can stand on its own. 
when its context can be itself. And when juxtaposed, it's apples to apples. It's a democratizing sort of technique. So for me, you know, it was never an aesthetic choice. It was a functional choice in wisdom. How do you get all of these people on the same level to just be human, not he's in his fancy house in his fancy office in front of his car. I mean, the environmental portrait gives a lot more information than I'm interested in. Yeah. I'm basically interested in like what's in a mugshot. Yeah. And to me, what it does is, first of all, they're ar arresting, they're visually arresting, they're beautiful, but then they invite observation they make you lean in and they make you look at something that you might have seen a thousand times before in a totally different way because the context is spare. And so it's putting this element under a microscope in that way. And I just think it ties very much to, to your whole idea here about listening and observing. And so I don't know how conscious that is, but it's it very, very much shows. I mean, I'm very aware only because I've been doing it for so long of the levers I can pull. And so I can use surface aesthetics and beauty as a lever to pull you in, to get you to slow down, to take a look a little longer than you may have in another context. I'm very aware in the power of beauty. And unfortunately, it's quite lacking in our current world. I'm long on beauty. And I think that, you know, the natural world us included, has provided the most beautiful things, far more beautiful than any, any piece of art could ever be made. And so I've just been trying to get myself out of the way and reveal what's inherently there. And so my job is to present it to you in as clear and coherent terms as possible. And, and that often winds up just releasing the inherent beauty in the subject whether it's a human face or an animal or, or flower, anything really. You know, I far prefer the subject to express itself rather than be a, a symbol for something that I'm expressing. And that has to do with a kind of, kind of feeling like, it's kind of like, you know, you look at a baby, oh, what's he going to be? It's like he is mm. or she is. Like this idea of what is, is mm. enough. And we don't spend a whole lot of time looking at that. Yeah. I learned this lesson. I took a drawing class um, in my 20s. And the thing I learned about that was that drawing is about looking. It's about how you see because we bring to everything that we see symbolic meaning, right? So we look at a house and we're like, oh, that's a house. And so when we're drawing a house, we recall, okay, there's a square with a pitched roof and a door and it looks like a child's notion of a house. But if you forget that symbolic thing and you start to look at the details, the light, the way that form intersects, and you just you don't even have to look at the paper as you're drawing. You can just have it trail your observation. Then it starts to look like a house for real. You talk to any musician in the world and they'll say music, making music is about listening. Hmm. And yeah, I did a book on music and that was the consistent feedback I got from all musicians. What is it really about? It's about listening. And so... I think the equivalent in visual terms is that it's about looking. Looking is listening. Like our eyes can actively listen in the way that you can actively listen to a piece of music. Yeah, and that's why I really dislike the word consumption, right? Because consumption implies this passivity. And I think what we're talking about is active ways of experiencing all facets of life. Yeah, like it is just unbelievable what is happening in front of me right now. And my understanding of the world is immense yeah. because of my experiences right. as yours and everyone else's is. So I often think if an alien were to land here, how little they would understand because of their lack of human experience and their collection of internal selves. So, you know, it is truly shocking how much we know, which is why it's interesting in the current conversation around AI and just in general with technology and the the arrogance that is being applied to what we think the power of these technologies actually are because they lack human experience. So look, large language models, AI, it's fascinating. I've spent my, a lot of my time on a lot of these platforms and learning about them. But the reality is that my human experience is always gonna top all of that. 
And I do not believe in this idea that creativity is being replaced by Dolly. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, you know, that that human writing and creative writing is being replaced by chat GPT or any of the others that are coming out. It's just not true. We no, can I agree. We can draw from a data set and synthesize and make maybe new combinations of ideas. Sure, we can remix records all day long. But what amazes me that no one's talking about right now is how limited our data set actually is. Okay, we're standing next to your, your library. You love books. I love books. When I walk down my library and there's two, 3,000 books, 10% of them may be digitized. Yeah. The lack of data that actually sits on the internet today or sits on servers anywhere is immense. People don't realize that. And the experience of going through someone's library, which is kind of like, a, in many ways, kind of a, a roadmap to their, to their experience of learning, you realize that like, well, yeah, of course we're not going to get the feeling of newness or completion or, I mean, it would just be a very different situation if we were. Yeah. And I think, you know, so that's books and books are a medium that are relatively easy to digitize, right? And most of our AI models don't have them as source materials, but also Google doesn't have them as source materials when you're searching for something, for an answer. But I, think co of, I collect yeah. 17th century Ikebana hmm. scrolls. It's a weird thing to collect. I know. <laughs> Um, what is an Ikebana scroll? So Ikebana, the Japanese are, are flower, flower arranging. Yeah, like yeah. Th that's an Ikebana. Yeah, there were two schools. The one I'm interested in is Ikinobo. Okay. And during their renaissance, that period, uh, this was being generated. And when these masters were arranging the works, they were then drawn and wood block prints were made mm. that were hand painted. They were talking like 1680s through the 1700s and they stayed within the school and they were studied and you know they're kind of like folk songs they were repeated over many many years so the collection that i have runs from like mid 1600s to maybe 60 years ago is the newest one i have and and i can show you i can pull out nine of them or something and i can show you how the art form has changed over time in subtle ways how the same expression, the same form, because it's repeated like a folk song, shifts and morphs over time and reflects culture. And not only can you not find these on the internet, but you can't find them in most museums <laughs> just because they're incredibly obscure and very hard to find. And I'll search for years for one. And so I just think about the amount of material that I actually consume that makes its way into my other work. And that's just, you know, there's no... yeah data set that has that. You know, it's funny. So I run an internet company. I spend most of my time with software, making software and software, which you'd think would be the most archivable thing on the internet is basically unarchived, right? So like most of the work that I've done in my career is gone, right? Every version of universe until this day is gone. My previous company's products, they're gone and there's no good archive of them because we don't know how to archive software. And to think that in this thing we call the internet that's generating new ideas and all this stuff, it can't even archive itself, no less the physical world, it shows how limited we are in our ability to process what's happening. And how vulnerable the information is. Right. I mean, a little esoteric, but I'm working closely right now with a founder who has a company that's focused on lunar data storage, mm. you know, putting putting servers on the moon, which is sounds cool. like sci-fi, but it's <laughs> very, very real. Sounds like a good song. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we learn anything from the failure of the Svalbard seed bank, it's probably a good idea to get our most important civilization's most important data off planet. The moon's a very hospitable place for uh, no atmosphere, no climate change, no climate change. Yeah. Very predictable weather patterns, <laughs> these incredible lava tubes that, that have very stable temperature. Uh, China's up there with rovers. Like the moon is our back of house. And I think moving forward will become more and more so, especially with really dangerous things, virology experiments, things like that. The moon is gonna be where we store information in the future, I believe. Especially with laser and the ability for up, up and down is- Do you think that'll change the sensory experience of the moon from Earth? Absolutely. When we look at it and we go, oh shit, my accounting data is up there. My, <laughs> my bank has all its data up on that moon. People think it's insane, but I really do believe that 
you know, especially when when we have very high performing quantum computing and and stuff. It's just yeah. From a climate perspective, we should have data centers on the moon for sure. But anyhow, I love getting involved in some of these projects that seem insane, but when you get really deep in and you learn who's involved and the level of need for these solutions, you realize like, wow, this can happen. And so lunar, lunar data storage is something that I've been thinking about a little bit. There's actually a payload going up in a few months that I'm gonna have an image on to one of the first servers that's gonna be dropping down on the moon. And so I think about how you know, we lost the Library of Alexandria. We've lost an enormous amount of human knowledge over time. Who knows what's been lost? We are so bullish on what we have and how smart we are and how advanced we are. We really, really, really overestimate and overindex on our capabilities and our achievements. And I think this is a, you know, product of a community that has been very successful through lacking cognitive empathy. I mean, we the have tech industry. I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. I'm with you. I agree. I, I mean, come on. And you know, my friend Christian Madsbjerg, who has taught me so much over time, I recommend his book, Sense Making. And he has another book coming out called Look, actually, about human observation. It's coming out in a few months. It's going to be incredible. Christian said to me a while ago, he goes, you know, they got up there and they said, this thing is going to change everything. And I thought, really? No, it's going to change how I order a sandwich. It's going to change how I connect with some friends but it's not gonna change my relationship with the world around me. He was very smart to understand that very early. Other people allowed it to change their relationship to everything around them. But I think this over-indexing on progress and innovation has been the major issue in our lack of understanding about what we don't know and how we should be moving forward in, in sort of different ways. I think it's nuanced though, because you simultaneously have this kind of humble perspective and this reverence for that wisdom, but you're also a futurist. I mean, whether you, you admit it or not, like you're clearly drawn to- Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. obsessed with near and far future. And technology. Oh yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. So to me, I think what's, that's so interesting. You're actually like- I'm curious, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not taking big bets but I'm curious. Hmm. Like I believe in the future and I believe in moving towards the future. And I believe I get excited by that, but I move through it with sort of wide eyed awe and curiosity, but a lack of belief. Yeah. But what you're also saying is, you know, we don't know so much, but also it's amazing that we're inventing these new things and we should push the envelope. Absolutely. And and I think that the key thing though is that you can have both of those things. Totally. It's not no technology or technology. It's, oh yeah, come on. It's both. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this, and I think that that duality of thinking is actually like just plain dumb. We see that all the time. I mean, we're seeing that now, like to return to early part of the conversation, we're seeing that in debates about, you know, where we're getting nickel. And like some basic things around, oh, we shouldn't be doing deep sea mining because we don't know enough. But right now we are cutting down rainforests and ramping up operations in the Sulawesi rainforest in Indonesia for nickel, knowing that we're killing massive amounts of, of species, biodiversity tailings into the water systems, child labor. I mean, we know what we're doing right now, but we're stopping progress on deep sea mining because they're saying we don't know enough about the ocean, despite the fact that the leaders in that field have been studying it since the 60s and have committed, you know, $100 million of peer-reviewed research through MIT in the last yeah. year. So I get very worried when people go, don't touch the oceans, as if the oceans are not part of our planet. Right. I'm interested in what we actually know, not in ideological thinking, about, you know, but like, where you we know, go. it's easy to think, you know, in listening to you that you would be, if we rewind the clock and you said, what do you think Andrew thinks about deep sea mining? I might think, oh, he'd be against that because we're intervening in an ecosystem that we don't know much about. So how do you reconcile this idea that we don't know a lot, but we should also intervene? We should learn. So deep sea mining has been a big hot topic. I'm interested in it. It's certainly on everyone's mind right now with the ISA in a couple of months voting to allow commercial operations. Look, 
we're going a little too deep into this, but polymetallic nodules contain the highest concentration of nickel, cobalt, copper, and manganese. The four things we need to do the EV, you know, to, to fully transition EVs. We're going there. We need to decarbonize. We need to move to EVs. We need a ton of metal to do it. The future is about metal, not oil and gas. We know that. Right now, we know where we're getting the metal. And if we thought about the earth as a single system, water and land, and could, could keep both things in our mind at the same time, and we decided we're going to pursue research on a known resource that can not only provide us with the metals we need for EVs, but also stop the current industry, which we know is bad, that's been going on for a long time. So then you look at sort of you A, B, the consequences and the impacts. I don't believe in moving forward without knowing. I believe in applying deep research, drawing insight, and creating strategy based on those insights. That's different from what we're talking about in the Valley, where social science and philosophy and anthropologists do not have a seat at the table. I have asked some of the biggest executives in technology right now, people at the forefront of what's happening, one in particular I can think of, where I said, do you have any philosophers, social scientists, or anthropologists on staff? Mm. No. But you're driving all of what's happening in AI, and you're not thinking about it from the perspective of human impact, all these other things. Like you're not, you're not applying the experts that we have who are trained in not knowing and observing mm -hmm. and knowing and developing insights out of it. I just think the lack of social science, which is a product of our education system. I mean, 10 years ago, it was like, oh, become an engineer, you'll have a job. Not become a philosopher. That used to be like a joke. Like philosophy was frowned upon as like a, you know, something that like a, a pontificating moron's doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you couldn't take school seriously, so you became a philosopher. It's like, no, we should be thinking about thinking. And thinking about thinking is missing in one of the most crucial moments in human history that we should be thinking about how we're thinking. So as the human transforms, luckily there are some incredible places like Tobias Reese's Transformation of the Human Project, other projects that are happening right now that are training high-level academics to go work with engineers and work within systems to be able to ask the right questions about how we're thinking about things. Yeah, so what I'm hearing from you is like, not knowing does not mean no action. No. In fact, the trigger for deep action. Yeah. Inquiry. Yeah. Yeah, not knowing leads to deep inquiry. That's what I'm interested in, yeah. So one theme I've also picked up from you and your work that's very attractive to me is you seem to attract or be attracted to greatness. Greatness seems like a theme. Where Where is that coming from? Yeah, well, mediocrity is pretty boring and it's depressing to me, to be honest. I mean, I don't want to sound like an asshole when I say that, but I am attracted to at least the desire for greatness. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've always, my whole life, I've been attracted to the kinds of people and projects that are striving for change and not some sort of self-righteous change or change for the betterment of other people or anything like that. It's not about doing good. I just love the idea of doing things properly. Like, why not? If you're going to do it, why not try to do it well? Because it's more fun and it's less boring. <laughs> so over the, no, I agree for sure. <laughs> Who are some of the people you've met in your career that that stick out when I say the word greatness? It's vast. Because for me, it often is in, for me, what defines greatness is a combination of, of their output, but also the process towards that output and how it affects other human beings. So I could tell you, you know, I could rattle off a bunch of big names that I could drop to you of people that I've spent time with and, and worked with them in close. But I wouldn't say that all of those have also been what I define as greatness based on how other people were affected by their actions. So I'm much more interested in in some of the individuals that I've met that I consider great, like there was this artist named Ralph Dorazio, whose work I, I have a large collection of, he's been dead for a while, but when I was young, in my 20s, he was the great uncle of a buddy of mine that I was in art school with. He had a loft on 23rd Street. Ralph was a contemporary of Nakashima, Noguchi, he was a wood sculptor. 
uh, came back from the war and moved into a loft in like 1947 on 23rd Street and lived there till the day he died. And he lived in a cardboard box in a corner of this loft, never had hot water, and the rest of it was wood and tools. And we used to hang out there, you know, all the time. And Ralph didn't really sell work. And Ralph didn't really have an art career that was, you know, of note. You could look him up and you'll find things that, you know, he did stage sets for Eric Hawkins, you know, was involved in some of the contemporary avant-garde dance, Martha Graham, people like that. But, and he traded some things. He, he traded for Nakashima pieces, things like that. He had some incredible things, but this was a, a, about mutual respect with his contemporaries. He believed in freedom and believed in greatness and believed that anything that would get in that way, he would just reject. So he didn't have a penny to his name. He was part of this artist loft law that his rent was a couple hundred dollars a month. He would maybe teach a student or two or have to sell a piece if he needed to. But for him, greatness was freedom and greatness was getting up every day and doing what he loved to do, which was work with wood. And he did that his whole life. And he comes up in my mind all the time. You'd expect me to say things like, oh, Steve Jobs or, you know, some of these people. That's not who I think of when I think of greatness. I think that they are high achieving. I think that they're extraordinary. I think some of the, the people that I've come across that have achieved sort of global success are obviously amazing, you know, but the people that I think about often that are greatness are people that I've had like intimate human relationships with that have impressed upon me through their actions, choices they made that made them who they were, like his inability to sort of function in the real world was just a product of his desire for freedom. And the work speaks to that. And I'm surrounded by it, places I live and things. And, and I think about that all the time. So Ralph Dorazio is someone I think of as like one of the greats. There are chefs I think of today that I spend time with that I think are amazing because they're thinking beyond what they're doing. Guys like Dan Barber and Daniel Hummer thinking about changing food systems and modeling that through their work. And they certainly don't need to. They could be running their Michelin star restaurants or, or you know, Rene Redzepi or something could, could keep going. But I think of the greats as the people that don't rest on their achievements, but they're seeking freedom and they're always running towards freedom. And freedom being how that how often I'm seeing it defined as one's ability to commit their time to their truest curiosity and inquiry and to not have a sense of of achievement or resting on any bit of the past, which I think is also a common theme amongst the greats. They generally don't rest on their achievements. They basically just keep moving forward. What is that for you? What does that freedom look like for you? I'm constantly trying to figure that out. I don't know. I'm constantly struggling with what freedom actually looks like and where I put my time because I think one of my my greatest faults is that I get really interested in things and oftentimes need to use a lot of self-control to not just go deeply into them. So I'll get obsessed with something and and move off of what I've what I've been doing. So I mean for me what freedom means to me and what like a version of me being great is, I mean, I'd like to be great. I'm way far from it. And that's not said with a false humility. It's, it's real. I look at most of what I make as like, okay, passable, but like we could do way better. And I just want to keep cranking it tighter, pursuing more and being more coherent and being more clear and connecting with audiences in a way that that involves them and collaborates with them and creates opportunities for immersion. And uh, I always feel like I just haven't gotten there yet. I feel like, I mean, close friends kind of joke with me about it, but I do often feel like not a failure, but it's hard for me to feel successful at all, partly because there's so much more I want to do and I feel like there's so little time and I feel like there's just the the realities of life. There's being great to me right now is, you know, I have three children. Like being great is being connected to them and being in their life and being like a good coach. You know what I mean? And I have people that work in my studio and I'm committed to them. 
and I'm committed to companies I've worked with, and then I'm committed to my own works, and a lot of different commit and boards I sit on, and and initiatives that I want to help. So being great is kind of being able to say no and focus on the things that matter most, and learn how to create space in your life for the things that really matter, not just the things that bring you a certain amount of money, notoriety, career advancement, these kinds of things. I mean, that's the hardest thing. Being great is the ability to say no to the things that don't matter as much, despite the fact that they're feeding you in all sorts of ways. If you had infinite resources, what would you do? Or what would you do differently? Well, I don't think my life would look any different. I don't think I'd have a different car. But would you spend your time differently? Like, would you work on different projects? Is there an ambition that you'd ratchet up? I mean, I think I'd have some, I'd be less cautious about certain decisions. Like right now, I'm really trying to get an LED wall in my studio to play around with. And, you know, that's a big decision. So, yeah, I might not buy the one on Alibaba. I might buy the planar one. But no, I mean, I really am living my life in a somewhat uncompromised way in terms of how I spend my time. And, and more recently, I made some big choices that would that would further that ambition. But I'm constantly trying to prune and and release things that are not serving uh, some of my most core ambitions, which is basically like, like enjoy what I'm doing and try to offer something that doesn't exist yet in the world. Do you feel like for yourself you have a personal vision or are you more pulling the thread, seeing where it goes? Personal vision of like how I see myself? Or more just if you look into the future, what is the work you're making? What are you doing? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. No idea. Have you always been that way? Yeah, I try not to think too much about the future. I'm not very good at strategy in terms of my own career and things. Like things occur and opportunities occur and generally they follow a clean intention. If my intentions are clean, usually good things happen. If I set out to make money, I'm not going to make money. If I set out to make a great book, I'm not going to make a great book. If I set out to follow today what I'm curious about and to refine it and to be critical of it and to look carefully at it and move through a process of it, well, in aggregate, I'll get somewhere. I don't think that vision is entirely honest. I think that vision is an aggregate of the choices you've made moment to moment. And I think that like really solid expression and really solid kind of bodies of work occur because of a of a kind of consistency of, of authentic choice making, of what you accept and what you reject, what you take forward and what you leave behind, in aggregate becomes something. But if you set out with an intention of, of success on some level or some benchmark, it generally just, for me at least, it doesn't happen. It happens for people I know and I'm amazed by that. They can set goals and achieve them and awesome. I'm just not very good like that. Yeah. It's interesting for me, I think, you know, I went to, a business school for undergrad. And there really is no better place for like the achievement ideology than a business school. And there's actually not that much of a focus on process. There's mostly a focus on outcomes, but yeah. not much of a focus on how you actually make those things happen. So it's very easy to get confused in that world with thinking mostly about outcomes, about outputs, about numbers, about finance, but I think for me, a lot of my career has been about just getting closer to process, trusting the process. Yeah, that's what we're, I think we're talking about. Like, for me, it's never been about the outcome. It's always been about the process. Yeah. Like, that's where it is. That's the, the, the doing of it is where the success is, not the outcome of it. Mm. In fact, oftentimes, my biggest successes or, or the, the ones that I've been kind of fortunate to be a part of have not been the highlight or what I think back to. They're the afterthought. And it's generally when ego and and sort of personalities and, and ambitions and all these kind of funny words come into play for people. But the process is not where that happens. The process is where the, the, the purity is. But how do you think about, you know, so you were talking about how your first project, Creature, or the one that became big, that opened up a lot of doors for you. So how do you think about the tension that success actually does open doors. Well, it certainly does. But meaning, if you look back and those external success moments are not the things that 
light you up. But when I think about that book, for instance, yeah. I think about the joy of making it. I think about the collaborator, David Meredith, who I collaborate with to this day, who designed that book and every book I ever put out, actually. And that just the joy of David and I working together and asking questions and, and wondering. And then the joy, sure, there's also a joy of you put the thing out and, and everyone says, this is going to do nothing. And I mean, the, the, the negative comments that I got before that came out and the fights I had to have to get it out the way I wanted it. So there was also a certain joy and, and, a, and a sort of validation that something you believed, maybe people hadn't seen before, but they would like, there was space for in the world, that there actually was space for in the world, that felt really good. But I've had also big failures and that, that I looked at deeply and thought, why didn't that work? Why didn't that connect? Oh, you know, I think maybe it was rotten from the start. Maybe there was a bad intent. Maybe there was, well, that one sold, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies. Let's do another, just like it. Well, that's probably not a very good reason to do something. You can't repeat success. I think you can have, you can connect multiple times in your life and you can hit multiple times in your life, maybe if you're lucky, but you can't repeat any one of them. You kind of have to start from nothing. There's all this, these stories about early days of great inventions and people that have been able to, to reintroduce time and time again great products over and over. And, and those stories generally are about like, they sit down and they don't do, they don't say we're making version three of this. They say we're making version one of it, even though we've done it a couple of times before, we're throwing everything out and starting over, you know? And it's that, that belief of first principles and knowing the now only happens when you forget the past. So I feel like- That might not be true, but knowing the now only happens when you forget the past. There is a truth in there that, that understanding the now it's necessary to not be stuck in the past because you can't For see sure. it clearly. You're being present. Yeah. You're an artist by trade. You have many friends and a front row seat in the company of artists, but you also see business up front. You see business people up front. You see technologists up front. You see academics up front. Yeah. Similarities, differences between these categories of people, or do you think that there's actually more personality types that show up in different media? So I've, I've just never... I don't know. I can't, I've never been very good about describing what I do well. That's a big fault of mine. It confuses people that don't understand uh, what, what's going on here. I didn't know you did that. And, you know, I've never believed in this idea of artist or businessman. Yeah. I've met some lawyers that are more creative than any artist I've ever <laughs> met in my life. You know, like, and, and are incredible storytellers. Yeah. So I've just never seeing these delineating lines between the sectors people work in. I think those are the fields we play on and the greats can play on many different fields. I'm interested in creativity and where creativity sits. And creativity sits in business, it sits in academia, it sits in the art world certainly, it sits in lots of areas. You know, earlier you asked about like greatness and I'm thinking about it, it's like, I'm interested in creative greatness and creatively great people are open, they're fun to be around, they wanna build things, not destroy things, they wanna support the people around them instead of win. Creativity is not a competitive sport, it's a collaborative team thing, and I'm just addicted to that, and I've, I've been lucky to find that in lots of different places, in companies and you know all over the place. And where I can be helpful at times in different areas is in the clarifying of complicated things. I have an ability to take something complicated and make it understandable. Only if I understand it, and that's what takes all the work. It's sort of the time I put in to understand something. And then I can generally figure out a way to communicate that to a broad public that can be rich and dense, but simple. Do you keep many projects in your head at the same time, or do you work on one thing at a time? My projects generally take a lot of time, so I'm, I'm overlapping lots of things. Parallel threading. Yeah, there's probably five or six things happening always at the same and time. When you have ideas, are you like actively on your computer or looking at the work, or are you going for a walk or in the shower? Is it more of like an imagined... Um, I get curious about something, and then I start looking around for it, and then I... Sometimes I'll commission research on it. Sometimes I'll do my own research on it. Whatever I can get. I mean, I'm resourceful. So when I get into something, I don't believe that creativity kind of like strikes and that's not how it works for me. 
creativity or ideas, I think, come when you make room for them. And for me, making room for ideas often is in behaviors like you're talking about. Taking a walk, making space for idea making is important to me. That's active. Time in nature is huge for me. And I, I tend to, despite the fact that we live in Manhattan, you know, I do spend a lot of time upstate and in other areas of nature. And that generally gives me ideas just because there's space. But no, I don't know where they come from. They just sort of come, but you can't force them. And you got to make space for them. And you got to surround yourself with people that are also looking for things. Looking for ideas is different for looking for things in a way, just to clarify, like, like, I think you can surround yourself with people that get obsessed with things. And there, there are people that get obsessed with ideas. And sometimes they, they cross over, but I tend to keep company with people who are interested in ideas. Mm. How much has New York City affected you and inspired you? It's everything to me. I mean, New York's really important to me. It's in my blood. Both sides of my family came over here, you know, straight up Ellis Island deep roots in Brooklyn. My parents left, but I spent time here as a kid. My parents grew up here in Brooklyn. And and I just, I don't know. I, I just always saw it as the only place one could live. I could spend time in other places, but I couldn't live in other places. And the reason why is, is that New York is, people call it the melting pot. Sure, it's a, it's got a lot of different people from a lot of different areas, but there's a diversity of thought here. And there is a a sort of commingling of socioeconomic strata that I find fascinating. Value in New York, like an individual's value, say, to speak about it crassly, is often connected to their ideas, not their the exit from their last company or their PL. New York respects ideas. I can't say the same about every other city. It is not a one industry town. I grew up in you know, near DC, that's a single industry town. Hollywood, single industry. Silicon Valley, one industry. New York, what do you do? I don't care what's going on. You know, like there's, and also, I'm sorry, but there's the greatest collection of cultural material in Manhattan <laughs> and unbelievable. And I, I love Manhattan. I love the people in Manhattan and the city broadly, but you know, I live in Manhattan because provides me access to a kind of lifestyle that is maybe just so different from my childhood, so not suburban. I don't like big sky. I like buildings. Mm. I like infrastructure. I like concrete, something about it, you know? But you also like going upstate. Yeah, I, I don't like anything in the middle. I don't like companies when they're in the middle. You know, companies are great at the beginning when they have nothing to lose, and at the end when they have everything to lose. In the middle, it's not very interesting. I feel the same way about mm. kind of environments. I like New York or the country. Right. I don't love an in-between. No, that resonates. That's why I like the desert, you know? The desert's like the opposite of New York. Yeah. Yeah, I like the poles. I like decisions, you know? I mean, I don't like wavering. I don't like in-betweens. I don't love gray. Yeah. Talk about an experience you recommend for someone who's at the beginning of their creative journey, who doesn't know exactly where it's going to go, but who feels it, they feel it in their gut and they're curious more than anything. You know, what do you recommend? To shut the critical mind off. I mean, for me, that's been it. Anything that's worked out for me is because I shut off that critical mind. I shut off the mind that said, nah, might not work for this reason, or or you've seen that before. Someone did something like that. The the anxiety of influence. I'm so against that. I'm not the first person to make pictures on white. There was Richard Avedon. There was Irving Penn. There's a you know there's some <laughs> story tradition giants. Yeah, but you're never going to look at one of their pictures of mine and, and think they're the same. They're just not because they were done by different people. I think that we are we we cut ourselves off so early, and I just think that we have to honor within ourselves, if you're curious about something, there's a reason for that. To me, that's divine. Ideas are divine. They come through us. And it's, it's arrogant. It's just false to think that you know before it's even happened. Yeah. So like my advice to anyone is pursue. Like if you are lucky enough to catch an idea in your mind or to catch an interest, you got to grab that and hold on to it and protect it and keep it going. 
and feed it and nurture it until, you know, you're like, ah, it's, it's not going to happen. And then kill it quickly. I think that that's the other thing. I think there's two sides to it. It's like, go all in and then kill it quickly as soon as you know, as soon as you get the instinct that it's not going to happen or, or that it's not bringing you some sort of joy or inspiration. Cool. I think Andrew on that, we'll, uh, we'll call it. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd want to add? Just that I'm super excited about your company, actually, from the minute you uh, you showed it to me. And just like not to gloat too much, but the reason I'm so excited by Universe and its possibility is that we're existing in a world where access and the speed and the frictionless moment of getting an idea out there stabilized and interactable in the world is just allowing new things to be put into the world. And the idea that we can build a whole website that can sell something or, or, or have a two-way communication in like a couple of minutes on our phone is very, very exciting. Because the more we break down the sort of stage gates for ideas to get put out in the world, the more good things we're gonna have. So like, because of what you guys are building, you could put something out, look at it, see it for real in the real world. And it's not so precious. And it didn't take tens of thousands of dollars to make. And it didn't take investment and everything. It just, it's there now. And then if it works, great. If not, okay. Totally. Yeah, I mean, thank you. But the inspiration for me starting this company, and honestly, I've been working on this idea for like eight years in some fashion. Like it didn't start as a website builder. It has evolved it felt like an idea that I just couldn't not pursue. But really the motivation for it, because I was thinking about a lot of business ideas before I started Universe, and they were all really interesting projects. But the reason I did this one was I felt like the world needs more ideas. We need more ideas. Everything is possible, but we need humans engaged in the world. We need people making the world together. And that technology actually allows for that to happen at a whole other scale. Like we can collaborati collaboratively build the world at just a cosmic level now because the tools are in all of our pockets. But I realized that there were just blocks in the way of that happening. And they were technical blocks. They were design blocks. They were economic blocks. They were also just thinking blocks. Like people were rigid in their thinking about how you build stuff on the internet. And I realized like, huh, maybe this is something I can contribute to show that there is another way. There is another thought. And I will selfishly be the beneficiary of all these amazing ideas that then enter the world. And so that's the motivation. And like every time I see something that someone is doing, some business that business that they're starting, some product they're making, some art that they're putting out, like it's just confirmation and validation of that. And I, like you, I think, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why I resonate with a lot of your thinking and work is this just hunger for ideas. Like, you know, and not all, you know, most ideas aren't good, but that's, that's but okay. But we don't know until yeah, they're made exactly. visible. We don't know. Yeah. And, and I think that like designing an apparatus to make an idea visible yeah. and stable is really, really important. And I think it's one of the, the major upstream drivers of progress is just making sure that an idea can be made visible is enough. Because what makes me very sad is the number of ideas that just died before they even left the person's lips, died much less line. became an, you know, an internet website. <laughs> so Yeah, and I think the thing that gets me most hopeful about the future is I actually think the rate of idea creation is just accelerating, accelerating, absolutely. accelerating. And so I don't know the solutions, but I know we will have solutions, you know? Yeah, and we need, again, we need scaffoldings to hang that on. And you're building that scaffolding that anyone can hang their banner on. And I think that just that influence on ideation and on amplification is really going to be a driver for new things that we don't even understand yet. And the, in, the discrete idea, you know, kind of like mischief, how they, how they drop a discrete thing. It's very important because it's a noisy world and there's a lot going on and I can basically handle one piece of information, one idea at a time. Totally. You can't give me four. Totally. I could take one. Yeah, I learned this recently that 
Yeah, so there were 5 billion people on the internet. 5 billion people on the it's internet. It's amazing that 3 billion are not. Yeah. But it's also amazing that there are less than 400 million registered domain names on the internet. 400 million websites with domains. On an internet, 5 billion people. So less than 10% of humans, assuming a one-to-one person to website, have websites. But the reality is a person can have, like you said, as many websites as they have ideas. That could be hundreds. So the internet is still in its infancy. The web is still in its infancy. It can be so much bigger, but the barriers need to be brought down. Exactly. So that's what gives me, you know, sort of optimism and excitement. And I frankly, I get a front row seat at the bleeding edge of people's creative minds. I get to see what people are publishing on Universe before they share it. So cool. (laughs) And it's it's amazing. It's deeply inspiring because we're surrounded by, I think, a lot of negative narratives these days. And I just see, yeah, the frontier of imagination and the point at which it becomes a real thing. It goes from something in someone's mind to something in the world. It's very exciting. Andrew's taking my picture. Yeah, sorry. Had to do it. (laughs) Had to remember I was here. Thanks for having me, Joe. Thank you for coming. Thanks for listening to Internet Misfits. I hope you found the conversation inspiring, helpful, energizing, and insightful. You can find me on the web to continue the conversation on my personal site, joe.universe, which is joe.universe.se. See you out there. Bye-bye.